Thanks for coming today. We're, uh, we've acted uh, quickly in the light of the events of the last few days to put together a, a program on the, uh, the chemical attacks of a week ago and the U.S. response a couple of days later. Uh, I'm Bill Banks. I'm the director of, the, of INSCIT and uh, a member of the faculty here in law and in Maxwell, and I'm joined by my colleagues Bob Moret. Uh, and Jim Steinberg, uh, who between them uh, have tremendous uh, experience and expertise uh, pertaining to the issues here. So we're going to uh, talk for a little bit, but uh, get quickly to an, uh, an opportunity for you to uh, engage with us in a, in a discussion of the issues. This is obviously not only very timely, but highly important and very dynamic. Uh, the circumstances, facts on the ground may be changing even as we speak. So I've, I've asked uh, Admiral Moret to talk a little bit about what happened, uh, sort of the operational context, uh, Professor Steinberg to talk something about the policy and strategic environment in which the, uh, the attacks and response occurred, and then uh, last and perhaps least, I'll talk about the law uh, when, when we get to it. So, uh, Bob. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Um, good morning. It's good to see you all here. What I'm going to just do is walk through a few slides that I'll thank Martin Wallace for putting together that uh, walk through the events of last week uh, just quickly. And again, just for context, uh, the attack that took place using um, uh, chemical agents, a, a sarin nerve agent, which is one of the most uh, sinister kinds of chemical weapons out there, much more so than chlorine and other kind of uh, chemical agents that can be used, took place April 4th, first part of last week. And uh, there was uh, fairly uh, comprehensive reporting on it by uh, the press, which uh, was provided a fair amount of uh, detail in terms of the attacks and the, uh, the embedded media that were, in this case, a part of northwestern Syria, which is in the control by the Syrian opposition forces as opposed to the government forces. It was fairly extensive, and as you might expect for an attack of this type, a, a significant global outcry in the, uh, the days after the, uh, the event. Uh, as a result of that, uh, fifty nine Tomahawk missiles from two uh, guided missile uh, destroyers in the eastern Mediterranean to a target, which is a Syrian air base, uh, which is a, uh, as uh, clarified by the United States intelligence community, a site for storage of chemical weapons. It's also the air base that the aircraft, which dropped. Uh, the ordinance on the Syrian village the first part of last week uh, conducted their operations from. The, um, one of the points that I'll get to a little later is that while the, uh, the target in this case, which is the, represents the first time the United States has done a dedicated target against a Syrian government installation, uh, the actual effect of an airstrike in Syria was um, unremarkable in the sense that we have been doing that since the onset of what is Operation Inherent Resolve, which goes back about two, two and a half years now. Um, and in fact, just for context, uh, there have been around 7,500 strikes in Syria by the coalition forces, predominantly mounted by American um, uh, Air and Navy assets, but also by a coalition of 11 other nations. And Syria, going back to the onset of Operation Inherent Resolve, technically the strike that took place on the night of April 6th, 7th, was not part of that operation because it was not in support of operations against ISIL or Daesh. Uh, it was against the Syrian government. So the target itself was noteworthy, but the, the fact that ordinance was expended in Syria was not um, the least bit extraordinary. Uh, here are the specifics of the strike, and you can even see some uh, combat assessment uh, imagery on the bottom right-hand side of the corner. Um, the decision that was made was uh, very much consistent with the operational authority, and, and Bill and uh, perhaps Jim, but Bill will talk about the, uh, the legal underpinnings for it, but in terms of the way that the chain of command work, it worked, it came out of a recommendation from the uh, commander of the United States Central Command who teed up a range of options from his air component commander on things that could be done in response to the uh, chemical weapons attack against the, uh, the Syrians. And uh, at that time, it came up to the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, who, working with the National Security Advisor, H.R. Uh, McMaster, provided a range of options uh, for the National Security Leadership Team to um, evaluate, something which Professor Steinberg has a lot of experience in doing, 
and a, a recommendation was made by the Secretary of Defense, and then the uh, decision was made to conduct the strike such as it was with the Tomahawk land attack, uh, land attack missiles, as I mentioned, from the two uh, U.S. Navy destroyers of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, some fairly significant uh, press coverage afterwards, as you might anticipate any time an action like this is taken. Uh, I guess the only comment I would make is I was surprised that in the press coverage that took place in the days after the attack, which again was noteworthy because it was the first dedicated airstrike against a Syrian government facility, there was uh, no discussion or really acknowledgement of the uh, significant air campaign that has been taking place against targets in Syria, as I mentioned, for about two and a half years, which is uh, the exact total and the daily estimates are put out by the um, Operation Inherent Resolve uh, Combined Task Force is uh, 7,840 strikes have taken place in Syria in the last two and a half years, which has largely been out of sight and, and not gotten the amount of uh, t press attention that you might anticipate. Uh, I mention that because uh, the fact that these types of weapons are used is a little unusual and not really. Um, the target itself was unusual because it was Syrian government, but the fact of the air campaign which has been taking place in Syria and also in Iraq, which are almost equal numbers for the last uh, two and a half years, is not, uh, not remarkable at all. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over to my two colleagues here at the table for, uh, for their remarks. Jim, you, uh, you, you've been in, uh, in positions that uh, equivalent to those that the decision makers were in in, the, uh, in getting this operation going as Deputy National Security Advisor and then as Deputy Secretary of State. How does this all look to you? You know, we're obviously in a space which has been uh, a set of issues that policymakers have been dealing with on a sustained basis for a long time that broadly fall under the category of limited war. And limited war is a very complicated and very controversial uh, policy uh, environment because uh, unlike sort of the way in which military traditionally is thought of, which is to defeat the enemy, limited war uh, raises questions both of what are the objectives and what are the means, and uh, whether there are constraints about both the objectives and the means. Um, part of the difficulty is when you uh, engage in total war, uh, you essentially have made a commitment to use all means necessary to achieve your objective, which is the defeat of the adversary. But here you have a complex interaction between uh, not being prepared to make the commitment to use all means necessary to achieve your objective, and yet having put yourself out there to achieve the objective. And so policymakers are constantly faced with this fundamental question, which is, can you state an objective? which can be achieved by less than all means necessary, that is at a cost uh, in blood and treasure that's acceptable uh, to you. Uh, and how does the adversary understand that if the adversary understands that there is a constraint on how far you're prepared to go to achieve the objective? What would convince the adversary um, to, uh, in effect, acquiesce in your limited objective uh, under those circumstances in which you're not prepared to use uh, full means. So you have to start first by thinking about what are the plausible sets of objectives that might trigger the use of military force under these circumstances. Um, the Trump administration is tied, this as you've seen, to the use of chemical weapons. So there's, there's a nexus there with chemical weapons. But then leads you to the question about is the objective to uh, uh, degrade the capacity of the Syrians to use chemical weapons, uh, or is it to influence the calculation, the political decision making of the Syrian government uh, about using chemical weapons? Those are two very different objectives because if you're pursuing the first, then you have to have a military strategy, as Bob will say, that identifies all of the infrastructure associated with chemical weapons production, delivery, storage, etc., and do what you need to do to make sure that for at least X period of time that they can no longer do that. And if your goal is to, your goal is to find the stuff and use chemical weapons, you can see that that's a plausible objective if you can identify the means that would achieve it. There are also complications because since they're chemical weapons, part of the problem with destroying us, you might actually trigger them. But you, you, can, you can define for yourself an objective, which is he's using chemical weapons, um, we, are, we don't want him to do it anymore, therefore we're going to make it impossible, physically impossible for him to do it. That's a set of objectives. And then you turn to your military colleagues and say, can it be done? What would it take to get it done? There's a second thing that says, well, that's complicated, there are risks, but maybe we can dissuade him. So rather than incapacitate him, we're going to dissuade him from doing this by convincing uh, him that the cost of doing this is uh, 
greater than the benefit he gets. And there you would be trying to influence uh, both by the military operation that you take now and the threat of future subsequent military operations to look at the, the cost benefit. Um, and again, more complicated because you can't kind of turn to the military and say, what's it going to uh, do to dissuade him to do that. You have to turn to the intelligence community. You have to take people who are going to assess, well, why does he do it in the first place? Are there alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. But you could still make a calculation that, that says, here's a level of cost that may influence his calculation. That's all well and good if you decide that that's good enough. That is, if, if the only thing you want to do is to stop the use of chemical weapons. But of course, as we've seen throughout this conflict, that there are lots of ways to kill women and children, horribly, that don't involve the use of chemical weapons. So then the question becomes, all right, let's say you've done this and you've, you've incurred the costs and, and borne uh, all the risks associated with it. And the next day, rather than using chemical weapons, they drop uh, napalm bombs or, or things that don't fall under the chemical weapons convention. Will you feel like you've succeeded at the end? And so when you only ask the narrow question about the chemical weapons, you then have to think about, well, will, even if I'm successful in this means ends test, will I be happy with what I've achieved and be willing to say, if I'm allowed to quote a phrase, mission accomplished, uh, if that doesn't happen. The reason I lay all this out is that because um, there's always a danger in these uh, decisions in which you sort of start with the immediate thing on the table and then you sort of work your way up to it as opposed to starting from you know what 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 is our the nature of our interest here are would we be satisfied with having the conflict continue bloody refugees instability as long as no chemical weapons are being used we don't know whether that question has been asked or answered but i think the fundamental question now is to understand is the uh, administration prepared to tolerate that because if they are everybody's going to figure this out, right? And, and it may be that, uh, that at least for a while, as we saw during the Obama administration, the Syrians will stop using chemical weapons for a while with the, with the clear understanding that they have, a, a, in effect, a, a green light to do everything else other than that. So um, we now find ourselves in a difficult uh, position of trying to understand what's the deeper game plan here. And is, there, is, is this it? Uh, it can be it. I mean, it could be, it could be said that's enough. Uh, that we have enough of a norm against the use of chemical weapons that just stopping that is worth it, not simply because of the suffering that it stops in Syria, but a signal that it sends to other potential users of chemical weapons that will do it. So there's a potential deterrence effect outside there. But that is very much focused on a very narrow objective. And even here, then, the question would be whether the means are adequate to achieve that objective. That's great. Let me say a few words about the law, uh, and, and then, because we're moving right along here, we can just uh, turn this into a discussion. On Saturday, two days ago, the President filed with Congress what we euphemistically referred to as the WPR letter. This, uh, this is a brief quote from it. Uh, well, no, actually, this is a quote from the resolution itself. That, that requires the president every possible instance to consult with Congress before introducing United States Armed Forces into situations where imminent involvement in hostilities is clearly indicated by the circumstances. Some of you know that War Powers Resolution was enacted at the tail end of the Vietnam conflict when Congress, frustrated by its inability to play a meaningful role uh, throughout most of that conflict enacted a law that was intended to assure uh, a more uh, bipartisan and interbranch collaboration in making decisions about the use of force in the future. Uh, most people would say the resolution has not served us very well. That's a discussion I suppose we could have, but it's sort of on the edges here. You notice that the president did not consult it does say in every possible instance, he might have argued that it wasn't possible in these circumstances. And you notice also there's a, there's a sort of predicate there. It's uh, one that's usually referred to as the hostilities trigger. It has to uh, involve the United States in hostilities for the war powers resolution to be triggered. I think it, under any standard, we engaged in hostilities last week in, in Syria. We also started an arm, armed conflict. I think I did put a piece, yeah. Now here's his letter. Your eyes may be better than mine. Can you see that? <clears throat> Martin, can we make, you can read it? Okay, good, I can't. 
uh, let me turn around. It, 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 these are uh, these are the letters. Uh, this one is a little different than uh, the hundreds that have been uh, sent to Congress by presidents, commanders, and chiefs since 1973. Uh, you see that the president determined, again, not before the action and not immediately or contemporaneous with the action, but almost 48 hours after the action. He was uh, He's required to report within 48 hours. I think he beat the deadline by about six hours. Uh, he's, he's directing the action to degrade the Syrian military's ability to conduct further chemical weapons attacks to dissuade the regime from using or proliferating those weapons, promoting stability of the region, averting a worsening of the region's humanitarian catastrophe. As for his authority, you see he, like presidents before him, cites the vital national security and foreign policy interests of the United States, uh, pursuant to his constitutional authority to conduct foreign relations as commander in chief and chief executive will take further action as, as necessary and appropriate. And then he's submitting this, uh, this um, uh, report consistent with the War Powers Resolution. Again, you notice he didn't say pursuant to. He's uh, keeping his cards here uh, regarding his obligations under, under that statute, which again is something that we could discuss. So why does the law matter? Uh, I think polls show as recently as this morning that most Americans su uh, support uh, the strikes that were executed by the United States uh, last week. Uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd remind you, particularly the law students in the room, but all of you, that you shouldn't conflate uh, the virtue of the cause with the authority for its exercise. It's very important to keep those two uh, two things distinct. Every action that the United States government takes has to be undergirded by law. If it's not undergirded by law, uh, then there's no constraint internationally and in the in the world international community for actions taken on behalf of government. Particularly with an operation as visible and controversial as this one following a horrific attack by Assad, everyone is watching. So it's important not only that we do the right thing, but that we do the right thing according to the rule of law. So it matters. This operation differs from a lot of others that the United States has been involved in in, in recent years. You all know, if you've been alive and well in the last several years, that we've certainly been striking in Syria. Uh, as as uh, Bob pointed out earlier, uh, hundreds of times in, in the last few years. Legally, those military strikes had a basis in statutory authority on the basis of the AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force that was enacted by Congress a few days after 9-11. It's a stretched legal interpretation that gets you from Al-Qaeda in 2001 to ISIL in 2016 or 17, but that's the legitimacy, legal basis for those actions that we've been undertaking in Syria and Iraq in recent months in, in regard to uh, counterterrorism uh, operation. This one, in contrast, this operation last week in Syria has to rise or fall entirely on the basis of the president's constitutional authority or some authority that might be derived from international law. So let me say just a few words about, about those two things. Uh, and we could talk about the 2013 red line. We could talk about the 2011 operation in Libya. We could talk about Kosovo in 1999 or any number of other examples, all of which are good points of reference if, you, if you'd like to raise them as we go forward. In international law, I think, I don't remember now what's on the slides. Oh, I, I did want to show you the contrast here in, in candidates and presidents. This. Uh, this this is Barack Obama as senator, campaigner Barack Obama, uh, making a very careful statement about the scope, the limited scope of the president's authority to act unilaterally. He can't do it, he says, in a, except in a situation that does not involve stopping an actual or imminent threat to the nation. History has shown that military action is most successful when it's authorized and supported by the legislative branch. That was in 2007. In 2011, in the wake of the Libya operation, 
Here's the president again. We've done what we said we would do. We had a unique ability to stop violence, an international mandate for action. That was a UN Security Council resolution and a plea from the Libyan people. I directed military actions against Libya pursuant to my constitutional authority to conduct foreign relations and as commander in chief and chief executive. You notice the tagline at the end there sounds very much like the language that was in President Trump's letter on, on Saturday. So international law, the United Nations Charter, as many of you know, says at the outset in Article 2, all members shall refrain in the international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. The United States violated Article 2, 4 last Thursday. There's no doubt. And under the Charter, the only way, the only two ways to be uh, legally excused from that violation is for a resolution of the Security Council to authorize the use of force or for you to have been acting under Article 51 in self-defense. It's a very difficult case to make a self-defense argument for what we did in Syria last week. So under the Charter, it appears as though the operation last Thursday was unlawful at international law. There is an emerging argument that's been made many times in recent years and it's being made again now with greater fervor for a humanitarian intervention exception that would extend beyond the doctrine of self-defense, beyond the language of the Charter, beyond any positive law on the basis of a custom of acting in dire humanitarian emergencies to protect against the further loss of life. There is no positive law uh, written for the doctrine of humanitarian intervention. Some of you have heard, to it, heard about it referred to as R2P, the responsibility to protect. It's a very strong political uh, document, theory, doctrine, but it's not reduced to law anywhere yet. Sometimes it's worth doing something that's as important as R2P, maybe, even if it's not lawful. There's a pretty good subject for discussion, I suppose. Because the UN Charter is a treaty under US law, a treaty to which the United States is bound, to which the Senate gave its assent. It's the supreme law of the land under Article 6 of our Constitution, so it also binds us in domestic law. Now, speaking of domestic law, Congress didn't authorize these strikes. This is not an action that could be supported under the AUMF of 2001 or the authorization for the use of force against Iraq. The United States was not attacked, so the president did not have a self-defense justification for acting as commander in chief. And there's an important set of values that support the need for two-branch cooperation and deliberation in advance of the use of force. Could President Trump have come to Congress last week and sought support for an operation to take out this airstrip in Syria? Of course he could have. Was there an emergency that required that he act immediately? No. Could he have gone to the UN Security Council for a Security Council resolution? Of course he could have. That's highly unrealistic because of the, of the inevitability of a veto in the Security Council. Certainly he's in a far better posture domestically with the United States Congress than President Obama was in 2013 when he set a red line in Syria, then talked about the importance of getting congressional support for an eventual military operation, saw that it was not going to be easily forthcoming, and backed away. 
President Trump could likely have obtained congressional support for a military operation in pretty short order, or at least it's arguable. We can throw that one out there. So what should happen now legally? Should Congress support the president's uh, operation after the fact? I would assert that, he sh that they should. They should not only go on CNN or, or make comments at home, but they should support him with law and enact some kind of a resolution, not maybe tailored to the specifics of this operation, but maybe crafted in a way that would invite or authorize at least uh, additional uh, the uses of military force against the Assad regime, if anybody can figure out what those should be and, and how they might be conducted. Uh, finally, let me, I'll stop in a moment. Uh, two, two questions. Uh, well, one comment and one question. The Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, Assad has violated it. He's not, he's violated it before, and it's been around for a long time. The United States is a signatory to the convention as virtually a, almost every other nation in the world. Think about what remedies could be undertaken to enforce that convention against a willful violator like the Syrian regime. Second is a question, what about the Russians? They're there on the sidelines. They were co-located co at the same uh, base. They were given warning that the, that the strikes were coming so they'd get out of the way and deconflict, in, in, at least in an operational sense, for a short period of time. But that was last Thursday. What about today and tomorrow and the next day? Well, can I make yeah. a couple of observations? Um, one, a terrific, <coughs> obviously, presentation, as always. Um, I would make one uh, caveat or one slight adjustment on yours, which is I, I think you're slightly underestimating the operational cost of having to consult with Congress in a big way. I'm not, I mean, there's the Gang of Eight option where you consult with a small number of senior leadership, which is almost always done. I don't know whether it was done in this case, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's almost no reason not to do that. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, because you mentioned the Russians, the, the difficulty of having even a, a quick congressional public debate while you're planning a strike like this, you'd have the Russians putting their planes and their folks everywhere so that you'd have to hit a Russian when you hit the Syrians. So I think there is an operational argument for not having, and, mm -hmm. and for that doesn't mean you wouldn't go back afterwards, yeah. and you wouldn't talk to the Gang of Eight, but I, I think you could make a case, and I'm sure the military commanders would make the case mm -hmm. that surprise and secrecy still matters uh, in this context. Mm -hmm. The second one I want to raise which goes to, it's the intersection between the law and the politics, which is, um, you know, a lot of your exposition about Article Two uh, is undergirded by certain assumptions about the, the roles of the two branches and the two institutions. And I think it's worth having the conversation, especially for those of us who are not originalists, um, to ask the question about in, in the modern world, and given the way Congress functions, after all, we've just seen what happened with Obamacare and with everything else, is it plausible to think that one could, that Congress could or would want to actually own these things. I mean, what we've seen, and I, now I'm speaking from a period experience, is that that although Congress will always sort of nominally stand on its authorities under the Constitution, that usually the members of Congress want the president to do this, to take ownership and to be accountable for that. Mm -hmm. That they they both neither seek to be nor expect under the functioning of the legislative branch these days to be the architects of a, a comprehensive systemic policy for the United States that would deal with the Middle East. Imagine what it would be like to have a conversation that, unlike the conversation we have in a situation where we think about what's our grand strategy for the Middle East. You could imagine that in the executive branch. It happens. It ought to happen more, but it happens mm -hmm. very regularly. How would that happen in Congress? How would you come up with a, doc, a document that reflected the view of Congress about what our long-term strategy in the Middle East. So I, I would make the case that, that as we think about this issue about Article Two and what's what's allowed, that we need to think about what are the what are the the realities of the conduct of a sustained and coherent foreign policy in a complex globalized world, and ask whatever the framers had in mind, whether some of these things, the evolved practice since the Korean War, reflects the fact that the country would not survive and function as a superpower unless it, the executive branch had the ability to conduct this up. And that we then want to think about what are the, the ex post and other constraints mm -hmm. that the 
political constitutional system can impose. And whether you, I mean, the, obviously the War Powers Act was an attempt to begin that conversation, which is to basically recognize that presidents are going to do what they're going to do. But that there's no reason after the fact then not to engage the Congress and then to see whether you can generate support for it. And so I, I put that out there. It, it is partially an argument about the Constitution. It's partially an argument from a practitioner about the fact that we wouldn't be where we were if we really thought that the Congress in the first instance had to be the, the crafter of big comprehensive strategy, including how to deal with this incredibly important situation that we're facing in Syria. Do you think uh, a small group might do the do the job if we could get around the you know the presentment bicameralism problem? There are there six are or eight there, or ten people are, who yes, yeah. I mean there there are lots of other ways to think about it. But I, the one thing I'd be confident of is whatever, however coherent or incoherent you think the current policy is to the Middle East, if you said, oh yeah, we're going to get those guys up the hill to kind of put it all together before we decide what to do, we'd be here into the 57th president. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, further re reflections? Yeah, just uh, again from an operational standpoint and uh, kind of reflecting on what Bill and Jim just said, um, we have been doing a lot of operations over the past several years in different places that probably could ask for an AUMF, and I'll defer to Bill on the AUMF, but just, just a couple of reference points. On Labor Day weekend this past year during the Obama administration, uh, we conducted air to ground strikes in seven different countries with manned and unmanned platforms, uh, not just in Syria and Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, but also in Libya, uh, Somalia, and uh, Yemen, and Pakistan, uh, just in the course of one weekend. So I, just, just to give you kind of a data point of the kinds of things that have been happening that uh, are publicly acknowledged by uh, the government, but not, uh, not getting that much attention. In addition to that, the ground operations that are taking place in a variety of locations around the world, which and uh, Professor Steinberg alluded to a key point. The big aid in the Congress is informed about virtually all of these things, and that mechanism has worked pretty well. But the broader dimensions for an AUMF for these, uh, what are clearly expanded operations, and the very thin line that goes back to the authorization that was provided the Bush 43 administration saying, well, this is all about Al Qaeda and successive organizations is something that I think uh, most people would agree needs some review. One final word on uh, the Russians and the Syrians, but uh, the Russians in particular. Uh, the most active proponents for, and, and you have to uh, use very careful words on how you describe what is happening between the Air Component Commander for the United States Central Command and his Russian counterparts in Syria. It is not cooperation. It is not asking for permission. It is airspace deconfliction. Uh, of interest, the most forceful proponents on doing something with the Russians by way of communicating with them relative to operations in Syria uh, were senior officers in the United States Air Force who are the Air Component Command for Central Command, not because they like Russians. It's just, as professional airmen, this is just the way they operate, and they, uh, you know, the checklist that you have for airspace deconfliction so that you won't have an unintended engagement between the United States and Russian aircraft, which would have a lot of second and third order effects, was what they were most interested in, and not in any way trying to cooperate with them. And, and just in closing, the, the expectation which so far seems to be reached, um, which was a, a gamble taken on the strikes that took place at the end of last week, that uh, neither Russia nor Syria would respond uh, in ways that would be fairly aggressive and really complicate uh, what it is we're trying to do in terms of our uh, Operation Inherent Resolve against Daesh in uh, Syria so far seems to be holding. But, uh, you know, the strategic planners in the Pentagon, as, as Jim knows so well, they're always thinking about the next step, and they already have pre-planned pre responses and a range of options you can have for anything that the Syrian government or the Russians may do in Syria. And uh, you always have to consider that, you know, what's going to be the next step and what's going to happen after the uh, initial strike from last week. Do you have any idea what a next step might be? You know, again, it goes back to, you know, what's the objective here? I mean, you can we go back to the, the uh, Map. letter? Because it really does illustrate the problem. Um, very nice. Right. Um, so, yeah. That one? Yeah. So I mean, if you look at this, as, as I talked about before, you know, he talks about degrade the military's ability to conduct further chemical weapons and dissuade the regime. Okay. So if that's the objective, then next steps might be, okay, well, do we, are we going to get the intel community to go look and see if there are other, you know, facilities or things that, that you know, store chemical weapons can deliver them? And maybe we'll go after those targets. Or 
maybe on the second one, uh, do we have to do something that's more regime oriented because we have to think about what dissuades him well, he doesn't care. He, yeah, he loses some money that he invested in building these chemical weapons stock, but it's cheap to re rebuild them. Mm -hmm. And so if we actually have to dissuade him, maybe we have to raise the price in a different way. So that might be the next step. But even worse, the, the, the nexus here, right, the, 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 the formal objective was degrade and dissuade. But there's a deeper goal here, which is to promote the stability of the region and avert the race. So if, in fact, he does these things, but neither of these happen, then the question becomes, well, next steps, gee, we are, we've identified our goal here is stability of the region and preventing the worst thing from So then we have to do a bunch of other things. Maybe we need to have safe zones. Maybe we have to have et cetera, et cetera. So this is where the sort of the identification of the objective then leads you to say, well, what's this nexus here between what are we really trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. And if he stops using chemical weapons, but the humanitarian catastrophe continues. Is this a success or a failure in terms of the way the administration itself has articulated the objective? Yeah.